Hello, and welcome to week four of the Technology, Innovation, and the Civil War course. I'm Dr. Nick Sambalock. This week is dedicated to preparing for your Gettysburg paper due electronically in March. If you are among those who have registered uh, prior to the 30 January deadline uh, for the extra credit to staff ride project, this week's materials may be of particular interest uh, to you for that reason as well. But uh, either way, all of you will be uh, looking at this uh, material because of the Gettysburg paper you're writing as outlined in the syllabus. I, uh, again, if you are involved in the staff ride, I highly recommend the book The Maps of Gettysburg by Bradley Gottfried in support of your staff ride research. Complementing the first seven chapters of Stephen Sears' excellent book, Gettysburg, I'd like you to watch Professor Len Funnenkamp's uh, video from the Army War College as he describes the issues that commanders face by dealing with unknown situations. When information is lacking, when information is faulty, uh, probably when, when both are, uh, are true and you can't quite tell exactly where. It is in the midst of this fuzzy static that generals must make decisions on the battlefield. This is a pretty important thing to, for us to understand as we write our papers and if we're involved in the staff ride to prepare for our, our staff ride presentations uh, on, on the terrain. People have to make decisions. Commanders have to make decisions based on what information is available to them and um, based on the objectives that they have to pursue. Uh, other decisions are more organizational na in nature, and we'll talk about those for a moment. These can be made uh, before a battle happens uh, happens to, to occur. Such decisions, nonetheless, can make a big difference in a battle, and they can have significant impact on the course of a major battle. Think about the reorganization that occurs within the Army of Northern Virginia just prior to uh, the Gettysburg campaign. There is no discussion board this week, uh, but there are important issues for us to consider as you prepare for your Gettysburg paper. Um, what is the underlying reason for Lee's decision? This is an important thing to be aware of, to grapple with in support, in preparation for the paper that you're writing. Is his decision, uh, given, you know, your consideration of what the underlying reason for his, for his campaign is. Is his decision a practical one? Um, it's also useful if you have some, uh, if you're thinking a bit about uh, union reorganizations regarding artillery. What factors are making these reorganizations happen? Uh, what forces are resistant to those reorganizations, probably? Uh, and why would that be? What would be the reasons? Uh, last, I think it's useful to, to keep in mind um, that before Chancellorsville, Hooker strives to solidify the unit identities of the Army of the Potomac components, the, those core that uh, constitute the, the Army of the Potomac collectively. He does this by introducing the core badge. Now, a core is a unit level uh, above division and below army. Every soldier in each of the Army of the Potomac's corps, uh, after this innovation, now wears a logo on the top of his forage cap, his military hat. The shape of the, of the logo, the emblem, indicates the corps that he belongs to. The color of that emblem indicates the division within the corps. For example, First Corps was shown by a circle that contemporaries noticed resembled a cannonball. Uh, Second Corps was a clover. Third Corps was a diamond. Fifth Corps was a Maltese cross. Sixth Corps was an unserifed cross. And Eleventh Corps was a crescent. And Twelfth Corps was a star. These are the Corps that, uh, when uh, brought together, constitute the Army of the Potomac, the main Union force in the Eastern Theater. For each of these corps, uh, the first division 
displayed the core insignia in red. Second division used white. Third division used blue. Thus, at a glance, commanders could tell, uh, as well as, as the men in, in the ranks, could identify the person, uh, the personnel of their own units, as well as troops nearby who nonetheless belonged to different organizations. Now, as small as it may seem to us, Hooker's introduction of standardized unit badges was a significant mid-war innovation. Meanwhile, following Chancellorsville on the other side of the, uh, of the war, Lee con reconstituted his army from two massive corps into three corps that were smaller than their predecessors, um, while still significantly larger than any single corps of the Union Army, of, the, of, of its opposing force. Although each of the Union Corps were smaller than their Confederate counterparts, the Union's Army of the Potomac consisted of far more corps than the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. For example, remember the, the Army of Northern Virginia has its Cavalry Corps and three, now three, uh, infantry corps. Um, the Army of the Potomac had seven infantry corps and a cavalry corps and an artillery reserve. It's uh, many more different units and a significantly larger total force. No one at the time could know that 1863 marked the midpoint of the war. It's interesting, though, to think about why the major armies of each side uh, in the Eastern Theater uh, are undertaking organizational changes that seemingly lead them in different directions. There's no discussion board this week. Uh, those will start again next week when we look at the tools and methods for supporting the respective war effort uh, of the Union and the Confederacy for a longer conflict, which I think is important to, to uh, grapple with at this point in the semester. So next time, we'll, we'll find out more about the Union and the Confederacy sustaining their armies. And I'll see you next time. Don't forget the clip by Len Fullenkampf, the Army War College. The link to that will be appearing uh, below in the text below the uh, video clip. See you next time.